solution to the quantum computations that occur in the brain. So it's much more than yes or no. But nonetheless, the question is, how do we get that? How is that the output of the quantum computation? Well, I can I can see how that's the output. I'm saying that because you have enough computations, even though they're they're unpredictable over time, if you have enough of them, you're going to get a tendency to to give you one. Tr you you said um, a a. Uh, what was it, a, a frequency or, or what was the... Well, 40 hertz, uh, every 40 times a second is, is, is what happens in the brain. There's, there's this frequency that seems to correlate with consciousness. So it could be that 40 times a second we have a, a, a moment of consciousness. Okay. As the philosopher Whitehead said, occasions of experience. So every 25 milliseconds, 40 times a second, we have a frame of consciousness, another frame, another frame, another frame. Now, consciousness seems continuous to us. We don't notice that we're not conscious in between because we're not conscious. Sure. And like a movie seems continuous <clears throat> rather than being herky-jerky because, you know... Well, we, we can throw all the in-betweens away. All we need is one frame of, consci of awareness right. of consciousness, and then we know that it, it, for, all, for all practical purposes it exists. And um, so... It, it, and maybe that's all that exists. But that's another story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I guess what I'm, I'm having problems with is no matter... Uh, even if we agree that the the uh, that the, the microtube that we have quantum computations occurring right now in our heads, all right. So it's not that it can occur. Temperature, or whatever, start limit our, our limited understanding of this whole new field. You know, the quantum uh, field that we've only really just started talking about like 70 years ago. So we're still too early to really have built enough theories and instruments and measurement techniques, devices, methods to really be able to to, to say that something isn't possible in it yet. Well, well, hang on a second, Greg, because <clears throat> quantum theory makes certain predictions, and out to like, I forget, 25 uh, decimal points that have been verified over and over and over again. Quantum theory is actually very, very precise. The indeterminacy comes in certain randomness inherent in, in quantum theory. Okay. But, but when it, the predictions that are made are very, very accurate. Now, the thing about consciousness and the collapse that we think occurs in consciousness, it's a different type of collapse than the randomness that we normally think of in terms of quantum indeterminacy. Oh, so we're even though so, so basically quantum computers are irrelevant because they don't they're not really they a metaphor collapse, right. for what, what is the the tech the method that it's actually occurring in our brains Correct. with microtubules. Right. They they are up to a point in that they're quantum computations, they're superpositions and there's this interaction among qubits. The difference is how the collapse or reduction occurs. In a quantum computer, the, the, the computation goes along and finishes, and then somebody opens the Okay, and there's some randomness introduced, but because you've done it in parallel, that, that doesn't matter, and you get the solution. So it's kind of like if I open the box enough times, something like the that, cat yeah. was dead you know, 99 times, and it was alive 97 times, so it's, oh, it's, it's dead, basically. Roughly speaking. Okay. Whereas in consciousness, it's a self-collapse. The superposition goes on until it reaches this threshold from, and it's of objective reduction, an objective threshold. And that objective threshold for self-collapse is due to the fact that it's, a, it's an actual separation in fundamental space-time geometry, as Roger predicted, and there's an instability there. So if you have a separation in the fundamental level, at, that are, the Planck scale that I was talking about before, there's some resiliency there. It's kind of like being in a bubble bath. You know how the little bubbles pop mm -hmm. because they can only last so long? So you have these separations and they collapse. And when they do that, those are not random. Those are also, not when the bubble gets, when the, when the, if, it, if a bubble tries to get too much bigger than the surrounding bubbles, it pops. Basically. Yeah, it's not this, yeah, whether it's the surrounding bubbles or, or it's its own intrinsic uh, instability. It, it collapses Something to, to do one with or the, the amount other. of mass available to the amount of separation. You can think of it as the size of the bubble. That's but I mean, if you had enough soap, then you could have a. I mean, the, the size of the bubble is directly related to the drop of the soap that you begin, or the the, the 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 bubble material that you begin with, right? I mean, when we were kids and we would take a big loop and put it in the stuff and blow a bubble, we got a big one because we could. It would hold. It was starting with a lot more material, right? Right, but but I think the opposite in that in, in this case, the larger the bubble, the faster it's going to collapse. The smaller the bubble can go on for a long time. Maybe that happens. In Doesn't it depend on the density or the available mass? Then is what I'm saying. It depends on the amount of separation, and it depends on how how far apart. But I mean, the amount of separation has to do with the amount of available mass to hold that separation stable. Right? Well, it depends how you look at, at at separation. For example, let's say we're talking about a protein, a microtubule subunit separating from itself. Okay, as the qubit, as the quantum bit. Okay. Is that the protein separating from itself? Is it the amino acids in that protein separating from themselves? Is it the atoms in that 
uh, protein separating? Is it the uh, protons, neutrons, electrons? Is it the atomic nucleus? You gotcha. can look at it very many. So even the, the map too, for instance, that Nancy Wolf talks about, which is the thing that suppose like lets go of the microtubule for a split second or whatever else, it get, allows it to be in a quantum state where it does not have any interference from the surrounding components of the of the neuron, say. Yeah, when the map to in Nancy's uh, work, she showed that when the neur certain neurons are activated, the map twos that normally connect the microtubules from the membrane detach. The microtubules go into isolation, therefore they go into a quantum state. Because they don't have the interference from they the They don't have the environment uh, causing uh, decoherence, so they're allowed to go into a quantum superposition. And they go on until they reach this threshold for collapse. They have their conscious moment, and then they reconnect to communicate the results to the outside world. But there are also maps okay. in between the microtubules that, that act to tune the quantum oscillations, kind of like frets on a guitar or, or some kind of musical instrument, mm -hmm. which is why we call them orchest orchestrators. They orchestrate the quantum oscillations. So, oh, hold on one second. Who, what's, what's doing the orchestration? The MAP2, the protein? Yeah, not the MAP2 is coming in from the outside, but in the, the microtubules in isolation, in a bundle. Inside of it, there is MAP2 as They're MAP2, well. yeah, connecting them, connecting and they act kind of like frets on a guitar. Or, uh, so, and a, or the corresponding uh, device in a, in a piano or a musical instrument to tune the quantum oscillations so that the quantum, quantum uh, computation can have some resonance in, in this bundle of microtubules. So that provides feedback also. The problem with quantum computing is that you need to be isolated the, from the outside world, but you also need to have input and output. We think this happens by alternating phases of input-output, like roughly 25, uh, 25 milliseconds 40 times a second. So you have a phase of communication, input, output. In the classical world, and then you have, and then the maps detach, you have buildup of the quantum computation in the microtubules, collapse, a moment of consciousness, you communicate the results, more input, then you initiate the quantum. So you repeat the cycle of classical quantum, classical quantum, having a conscious moment, and then communicate the results, input into the quantum system, build up the quantum, over and over and over again, 20, 40 times a second. So inside the microtubule, the basically, let's say, once it's isolated, then it, and isolated is that in that um, it, it doesn't have, so once the MAP2 is connected to it, there's a, it's operating at a certain frequency, you said, which was, the, I mean, when we study the brain, we're, we're looking at a, a general frequency, right? That the brain's well, operating 40 at. hertz is 40 is, hertz. is one is, seems to be pretty important. So okay, we, so let's say that, that everything around the microtubule is operating at 40 hertz. The let's say the whole brain's operating at, micro, at 40 hertz. But the, not, but when the side. microtubules disconnect, you know, the map two lets go of it, then the microtubule can operate at non 40 hertz. It can operate at what do you say, 25 or Well, 25 milliseconds, spectrum. no, no, that's the same as 40 hertz. 25 milliseconds is times 40 is one second. Okay. So when I say 25 milliseconds, I'm talking about the phase of the quantum computation building up and then collapsing. But the quantum oscillations themselves are much, much faster, 10 to the 13 hertz or something like okay. that. Okay, so, so that occurs within the microtubule. Right, right, right. And, and so those, it, it's operating at this extremely high frequency. In, in the quantum state, in the quantum when phase. When it's in the quantum phase. Right, and it's communicating non-locally with all the other quantum bits in the microtubules, and that neuron and other neurons connected through gap junctions and presumably throughout, throughout the brain uh, so that you can have this uh, fairly large number of tubulins involved so that it can reach threshold fairly quickly. Why would, they, why would, you, why would the neurons need to be connected by axons and dendrites if they were communicating already via the microtubules? I mean, we had walkie-talkies in different rooms. Why would we also need a, a string with two cups on the end of it? I mean, well, axons and dendrites uh, are, are noisy, so you have the problem of, of decoherence and thermal noise. If you try to get, it could be that, but I think if if you try to get the quantum across a synapse, you'd have to interact with the environment. The synapse being a, being the uh, part but, of the but environment. But you just say that the microns communicate with each other, well, the, neuron to neuron. Th well, we think it's through a different type of synapse called a gap junction. A gap junction is uh, kind of a window between cells, where actually the inside of one is literally connected to the inside of another. It's like opening a door. So a neuron connected to another neuron by a gap junction, this window or porthole, is really one, one big it's neuron. It's almost like, okay, we're, on, we're in opposite rooms, but it has a sheet of glass in between it, double-pane glass. We can see each other. So I can go like this. But only if everybody steps out of my way, then I go like this, and you can see me doing it. Or better yet, but, you just open the glass, and it's one room. So that, therefore, a quantum state would actually spread from one. 
basically you want one inside and one outside. So 